Justin, thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's really good to have you. Uh, for those that don't know you, do you want to give us a bit of a heads up? You know, what are you passionate about? What is it that you do with yourself? Well, I'd say I'm passionate about creating conversations around faith. Um, and that's kind of bridging the Christian and secular world. Uh, and that's what I've been doing with my radio show and podcast unbelievable for 17 years now believe it or not bringing christians and non-christians together for dialogue and debate uh and in the process of that i i wrote a book about that that came out a few years ago we run regular live events as well and we've sort of established a whole what you might call apologetics department at premier christian radio that encompasses other podcasts like the ask and to write anything podcast and others where we're just helping to try and get people to connect their faith with the world and be able to uh, share their faith with confidence with other people uh, so we'd kind of try to do that though by real world conversations rather than just telling people you know what to say yeah i think one of the things that you do really well and um i love listening to you when you are speaking at spring harvest or on on um, the unbelievable program is that you are really good at taking what is those issues that we discuss and debate in the workplace and we wrestle through, and we don't always know how to give a good answer. You give us material that we can store away that then you can bring out while sat having lunch with somebody. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've heard it said that what the world doesn't need is a, a million dollar apologist. They need a million one dollar apologists. Um, I think everyone's got the ability to to learn and take in some information and most of your conversations actually people aren't looking for a phd in theology they're just looking for someone who can help people them to make sense of the world and and actually i think there, there's a real value in just being able to dig into a resource whether it be a book or a podcast or a video and and then hopefully be able to implement that in your everyday life yeah which is really what i wanted to talk to you about today um, one of the things I've been doing a lot on the Making Disciples podcast, and we'll be doing a lot with at Spring Harvest this year, is thinking about the upside down kingdom, thinking about the Beatitudes, what it means to be different, to stand out, uh, to hold on to what we believe, but but to live out this kingdom in such a radical way. And one of the things I want to talk to you about is around disagreement. You know, Jesus mm. is best of the peacemakers. Uh, the idea with that sometimes is we think, well, we can't have conflict. We've got to make peace with people. But there is a way of disagreeing well mm. with each other, with others in the world, that is a dis it is a discipleship issue. How yeah. do we learn to disagree well? And you have interviewed and spoken to so many individuals that you do not agree with, <laughs> but yet you are so able to amicably discuss and debate with them. So I'd love to have a, a conversation around that. You know, tips and tricks or helpful hints for yeah. how we disagree well. But let me ask this first: Is it, in your view, is it possible? to disagree well it is possible but it's getting harder in the age of social media i think because social media sadly is set up for a kind of divisive kind of interchanges it's all about building echo chambers through the algorithms that select for hearing the voices you want to hear and not really engaging properly with the other side of the aisle and and the problem with social media is it disembodies everybody so that you don't feel like you're engaging with an actual human being so it's possible to disagree well, but we're kind of being set up for failure in the way our, our culture is currently getting us to interact with each other. And, and you see that in so many areas. It's not just you know religion, it's politics, it's culture, it's ideologies that are going this way and that. So, so what I, I think we need to learn the art of is disagreeing well. And actually, I think um, that's something that you have to get back to talking to people face to face to do well, because there's so much about being human that is about embodying um your relationships and and if you if you're not um actually engaging with people as fully human beings then yes you will never get to the point of disagreeing well because you'll only see that other person as an argument to be demolished or whatever it is uh, and for me that's been the, the beauty of the unbelievable show in a sense has been we've tried to push against that sort of soundbite you know lob grenades from your side of the social media fences thing by actually bringing people together for these long form discussions where it's much harder to be snarky or rude to someone you're sitting down opposite with uh, and you've got to have an honest conversation with them and I found you know surprisingly even people I didn't expect to get on actually in person even if they disagree they have strongly held convictions on both sides they can actually get on quite well as individuals um, and and for me that's where the real fruit of this is in actually developing 
the relationships that go alongside those conversations. Yeah. And it, and it is the two relationships and tools. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's these two things, isn't it? You might have some great tools for entering into a uh, conversation with somebody, but the, the, you know, this idea of building a friendship with somebody so that you can uh, discuss something in, you know, that, that sense of shoulder to shoulder, that, that makes a difference, doesn't it? Ab absolutely. It does. So, I'd say there are lots of relationships I've built with some of the atheists and agnostics and people of other faiths that, that you know, have lasted for years on the show. And, and you know, we kind of have chipped bits off each other over the years and we've kind of gone back and forth on various issues. But I'm really grateful, actually, that, that even despite our differences, we've been able to build a sense of, of respect for each other um, and friendship in many cases. Uh, because actually I think you're far more likely to have someone listen to your argument if you if you've act, if they feel like you're listening to them you know um, rather than they're just being used as you know today's debate opponent mm. and, and from that point of view I think there's a huge uh, you, you know a huge lot to be said for actually developing those kinds of relationships as I said it's it's harder to do actually mm. in today's world but um, I, I, I rarely think you actually change things unless you're actually in relationship with people are Arguments can only take you so far, but unless someone kind of sees the difference it makes in your life and and that sort of thing, they're only getting half of what they need actually when it comes to being persuaded about something. Yeah. I have a gentleman here that uh, is a Muslim guy, and met him thirteen years ago, and all he wanted to do was debate with me about faith. Yeah. And I actually said to him at that point, I, "I'm not interested in debating with you. I want to be your friend." And 13 years on, he sent me a text me this morning, a Bible passage that he's read. <laughs> and he's got a New Testament that is really well read. He's a Muslim guy, but he now reads the New Testament mm. with me. Mm. And it's all through friendship. Yeah. And he'd heard about something in our neighborhood that happened uh, at the weekend. And he sent me this lovely little message from the New Testament uh, just to encourage me. Mm. And I thought, wow, you know, it's only through friendship do you see past the boundaries and barriers that we create to really try and create true friendship? Um, I just thought it was amazing that actually yeah. we can disagree mm. on our faith fundamentally, but we can love each other. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And none of this is to discount the fact that you may still have different views and yeah. you may, you may hold those. Um, it's funny though, you know, that there's a different, sometimes there's been this mistake in our culture to think that say in the multi-faith issue um and having that kind of conversation that what doing multi-faith well is basically covering over our differences and sort of pretending they don't exist and sort of saying but yes but we all basically think the same and believe the same mm -hmm. i find actually the best conversations are ones where you acknowledge your differences and you actually sort of say look we do disagree on this we've got differences of opinion you know i don't believe the same things as you do as a muslim because i do believe that jesus is the son of god and i do believe you know and, and but it because actually you're you're treating someone with more respect i think by saying you've got a view on this and i've got a different view on this and we're not going to pretend we're all the same but actually there's also a respect that can go with that um because actually i find actually often with my muslim friends and folk that i interact with they're more they're more respectful actually if if you actually hold up you know you, you stand up mm. for what you believe in and you're, you're willing to kind of defend it but in that kind of gracious way where you're not casting them as your enemy but you're saying i want to come to the table and have a genuine dialogue with you because then you're taking each other seriously and and i think that's you know that's what really counts yeah you've already mentioned two things i think that are really important to disagreeing well you talk about listening and acknowledging difference um you might want to say more on those but do you know walk us through uh just some recommendations that you might have how we may disagree well uh and it's not just with regard to us and a muslim it could be us and us in the church yeah yeah absolutely. Uh, couldn't it so you know do you, you want to walk us through just some uh, you know thoughts that you have that could be helpful yeah i do and and i think you know it does come back to that sense of relationship but seeing seeing the person for who they are mm. um that uh, so often it's easy to treat someone, as I say, as as a caricature or um, just as a, an idea to to be engaged with or demolished. But actually, um, as I say, fruitful, really fruitful kind of dialogue that results in lasting change and even the possibility that one party or another might change their mind really comes, I think, from from having genuine uh, friendship and dialogue. And so so wherever you can build a sense of uh, a relationship with someone, then 
then that's great. Now that's that won't happen in every situation. We we can't be friends with everyone we we get into a conversation with. But I think um, that's important. Um, with, and in a Christian context, I think as far as possible, being able to acknowledge that you are brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever the particular you know issue is that you may disagree on. Obviously, for some people, there'll be some issues where they say, well, this, you know, I cannot call that person a sister or brother in Christ if it, they fall outside of this particular, you know, theological perspective. But where, wherever possible, I think we need to, you know, as that old saying goes, um, be generous as we can in the fundamentals. Um, uh, so it's showing grace to uh, to each other, being, you know, sure and standing firm on what we do believe are, are essentials, but but grace for the things that are perhaps non-essential. Um and go and go at it from that perspective where you're going into it not to have an argument but to, to to try and understand the other person's perspective as genuinely as you can being open to listening being open to having your own views challenged as well i think um that's important because as i say you can't expect the other person to 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 do the same unless you're willing you know in principle to do that uh and that can be difficult and uncomfortable sometimes because we like to very often surround ourselves with the perspectives that we all agree with and we've always agreed with. And it can be uncomfortable to go into a situation where you're hearing someone else put their perspective and it may be quite a cogent one, you know, it may be one that you hadn't considered before. So I think it's, it's about giving each other the time to lay out our case, listen well, uh, be willing to say, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm going to go away, look into this more and let's come back and continue the conversation, not to see it as a sort of um, debate where there can only be one winner and they, mm. it has to be decided, you know, I, un, unlike my show, which is always about an hour in length, you know, between two people, most conversations go on over days and weeks and years even. And and that's fine. That's the nature of, of how we sort of gradually, you know, uh, come to understand different positions and that sort of thing. So it's it's about that relational thing, that gracious thing. It's about listening well. It's about being ready to change your mind. Um, it's about being willing, you know, if you can, to pray with the person even that you disagree with. Because I think as soon as you let the spirit <laughs> into the conversation, it's amazing what can happen, even across, you know, significant theological divides. People mm -hmm. can still acknowledge their oneness in, in Christ. And uh, and for me, that's that's the beauty of the church, that there is a unity in diversity. Um, you know, to some extent, the church should not exist. You know, it, it should have fragmented and broken up long ago. Now, obviously, it has fragmented in various ways. But nonetheless, I still see an extraordinary ability mm -hmm. for the church to kind of miraculously hold together really quite diverse perspectives um, in a way that feels kind of God given in a way. And and to that extent, I think it's only because we can we can say there's something bigger that we're uniting around than the individual differences we hold. Um, so from, that gives me kind of hope that, that mm. the church is a good place, hopefully, to model those kinds of conversations uh, better, hopefully, than, than they get modeled in the culture sometimes. Yeah. I'd love to ask you, I don't know if you thought about this, but wh where do you find this in scripture? You know, do you have a model that you've seen you know you've seen this in scripture because what comes to mind is jesus going into the temple with a cord mm -hmm. whipping and clearing out and that's not disagreeing well jesus <laughs> um you know you, you you could argue with me on that passage what his actual meaning is about but you know do you have any thoughts around well do we see jesus behaving like this uh, are there contradictions in that in the sense that jesus went into the temple and cleared it out uh, or is there another way of looking at it altogether I think there's a time and a place and, and Jesus picked his time and his place. And as you say, there were a lot, I think there were a lot of reasons, you know, why Jesus did that in that moment. Um, and, and it's a lot to do with in that issue that, that, that there is a case, I think for saying some, when you see some things happening, you have to take a strong stand and you, if it's a justice issue, you know, it's not mm -hmm. necessarily something you're going to have a long debate about before you take a, a position on it. And Jesus obviously saw this as, uh, a, an issue of people being kept from God through the way that the temple had been used and abused by the religious authorities of his day. Um, and he did something very dramatic, you know, to, to, to make a clear example of it. But you also get at the same time, Jesus being very nuanced in other situations where, where he's talking to people he shouldn't in theory be talking to, mm. you know, um, 
women and tax collectors and sinners and everything you know there, there's a lot of sort of jesus seems to be willing to have audience with all kinds of people who you know he you know in, even in his position as a rabbi he shouldn't have been mm. uh been been willing to engage with um he appears to have been willing to you know cross some of those boundaries around you know uh when when a, a roman centurion comes to him or whoever he doesn't he doesn't say well hang on you know uh i can't talk to you. i can't sort of deal with you because you're the enemy there's a sense in which i get the sense that that mm. that there was a kind of pragmatic element to the way jesus approached people and and he was willing to to do that kind of uh thing um i mean obviously in the new testament generally there's this sense of keeping the bond of this the unity of the bond of the spirit and 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 i think for me that's that's the overriding thing as christians that we need to bring to the conversations we have um and for me um again you know when it comes to having those conversations with people who don't share our faith you know you turn to something like first peter three fifteen, always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect so mm. it's a sort of it's kind of a given that if you're going to have these conversations they've got to be done in this way um so I, I I feel like you know there's there's plenty there in Scripture to, that says it, actually um, the way we conduct ourselves in these discussions is really important as much as what we believe and and hold on to, um, even if there are points at which you know we have to part ways with someone if we really believe that there's a a moral or a justice issue mm -hmm. at stake, which means that we we can't continue a conversation. Yeah. So so yeah, those would those would be some of my my go to passages. Yeah interesting yeah i mean you've named a whole load of different you know in, in some ways you could call them principles or ways of behaving uh you know talk about listening acknowledging difference relationship unity being a key theological theme really in, in disagreeing well um holding the tension uh i liked what you said there about you know mm. sometimes we have to hold the tension uh and we have to have gentleness and respect uh for someone else i think i i love those C can we just go back to the uh, the listening one because this seems to me to be uh, one of the major issues uh it it's just around uh, we don't listen very well mm -hmm. we are really i i saw an argument break out between two friends last week they both love each other neither were listening to each other both thought the other was saying something completely different the next thing i knew they're, they're in a barney right in front of yeah, me i'm thinking yeah. I have just, and one of them afterwards is saying to me, "What well, wasn't, weren't they wrong? And I ended up mm. saying, well, actually, mm. I don't think they were wrong. I think you weren't listening. Mm. <laughs> and that, that was awkward to have that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Listening well. Yeah. You know, that to yeah. me feels like a discipleship issue to be able to hold the tongue, yeah. to pause and to listen. Uh, you got anything on that? I I th I think it's just a skill um, that you kind of have to develop. I, I think some people are born well they 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 kind of natural listeners others are kind of constantly want to step in and and answer back but it i think there's a, there's a grace that comes with being willing to listen and being willing to let someone have their say i mean for me you know sometimes christian apologetics is cast as this kind of it's about having all the answers and about um the confidence comes in basically being able to marshal all your responses but actually for me the confidence in in apologetics uh, and in evangelism generally is not about always having the right answer and being able to push back on someone it's actually about being able to simply listen mm. and and not to be kind of have this knee-jerk fear reaction of i'm hearing something i don't disagree with uh, or that's objectionable and kind of feeling like you have to immediately answer back it's about actually letting someone have their say and being so confident in a sense in in your perspective and the truth that you don't have to kind of immediately sort of tear into them and 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 bring them down and actually i think i think um it that's really helpful because it, it unless someone feels like they have been heard and that b before you start to give your answer they they won't they won't feel like you've actually understood them you they won't feel like they've been they've been listened to yeah. and and that's you know i think half the with a lot of the relationships i've made with with people who um are non-christians who listen to the show whenever i've seen people who have crossed the line it's never been kind of one argument that's sort of taken them from atheism to christian faith there's there's been a kind of whole cumulative set of things that have come together but more often than not it's also been because they've kind of sensed that 
you weren't threatened by their their engagement and and their questions and and that kind of thing that that actually christian faith is big enough and wide enough to kind of embrace people who have questions and doubts and don't haven't put it all together at this point and and my hope is you know that that you know there'd be that kind of humility almost uh in our conversations where we don't necessarily say we have the only right answer and but that we're kind of going on this journey of exploring truth together and and de- all depending on god's grace as we do it and hopefully that's you know it's in that kind of context that that you can genuinely start to to, to talk and and you know come to something i'd like to ask have you come across anybody that's particularly just really impressed you in the way that they're able to listen uh when it comes to apologetics is there anyone particularly who's in that field that you're in that you think you know they're just a they're just a great listener their technique Mm. is not to come in with the argument not to try and show how clever they are but it's just they're very good at just listening and and you know coming across as they're really taking on board what they're hearing have Mm. you come across someone Mm. like that I, yeah and the best the best the people who who kind of do it best are mm. are those who kind of have the you know the the academic kind of credentials maybe but they combine it with a kind of winsome gentle engaging inviting kind of way of uh, and then they're not just going in there to hammer you know the opponent as it were mm. um i mean the people that i've had on my show over the years that, that come to mind in that way um are people like john lennox um who's uh, a professor of mathematics at oxford university but whenever i have him on um he's got such a warmth and a kind of um a, a, a kind of manner that that just puts people at their mm. ease and he he wants the conversation he wants to, he's always interested in the relationship you know he wants to talk to that person off stage as much as on stage and get to know them and see who they are and and it just you just it just naturally encourages a different kind of conversation so some of the best conversations i've had have been with John opposite someone because th- there's just been a sense that you know um likewise I mean it's funny I just recently did a show with with Tim Keller who's who's a well-known Christian thinker out in the states and yeah. former pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church well known for his kind of books on Christian thinking you know the reason for God and things like that but again um I've just found him his approach very um humane you know in the way he then he does those kinds of interactions with with non-Christians and with skeptics um where he's not coming in you know i'm i'm the know-it-all pastor who's got all the right answers he's 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 open to hearing a different perspective and it's funny because just recently um there was a debate about you know that, that kicked off last year a lot of his contemporaries in the u.s asking is it time to abandon the tim keller winsome model of cultural engagement yeah. because there was this sense that you know we now live in this very anti-christian sort of culture and therefore we need to basically go in in a more kind of uh dogmatic militant style and we can't be nice to everyone we've got it you know and and i think that's a great shame and and uh, when i asked him about it on this recent show he said the problem is when you become when christianity becomes effectively a political movement like that it 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 loses that that kind of winsome cultural engagement and 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 i i want us to be more like tim keller than than kind of political activists when it comes to sharing the good news of jesus um because actually i think jesus said stuff like love your enemies and do good to those who you know he didn't say go in and sock it to them so um so my my hope is that you know we'll learn for those kinds of apologists uh, in the long run yeah i love listening to amy or ewing yes amy's wonderful. She, just yeah. the way that uh, i've seen her debate with somebody on stage and then get off stage and just stand there and listen yeah, really yeah. impressed with the way yeah. that she uh, doesn't need to win. Mm-hmm. She's not yeah. there, you know. She's not there to win an argument um, in the same way a politician might be. She's there to love people, and I think that's one of the things I jotted down um, just as you were talking earlier. You know, we've not talked about love uh, here, and and you know, it might be worth just touching on something around how you choose to love the person in front of you and not seeing them as enemy it does seem you were talking about social media earlier and i think there's a there's a danger that we demonize Mm. i'm the good guy Mm -hmm. and you you're the evil one you're the devil Mm -hmm. you know you can Mm -hmm. play into Mm -hmm. that i'm the angel you're the devil Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that does not allow us to love you know and it's it's often masked with a fake love where they (laughs) say i love you but yeah, yeah. No, you don't love them. I can tell by the way you're speaking to them right now. <laughs> now. How 
you know, how does love play in disagreeing well? How does that play out? I, I think it's genuinely about before you go into any conversation or debate saying, um, what does God think of this person? And as far as I'm concerned, God believes that person is made in him in his image and he came and died for them. They're that important to him. So wh whoever you're speaking to know that that is the way God thinks about them and that should affect the way you treat them. Um, and that, that could be applied to anybody in our life, in fact. But um, and, and so and the danger always and I've fallen into this trap myself is is once you're in the midst of maybe, you know, a discussion or debate where you are kind of trying to uh, defend and parry you know and and answer things it's easy to to fall into a mold of I, I i have to win this argument but the problem is um you can you can win an argument and lose the person in the process because it's it's so easy to sort of think that job done if i've yeah. kind of put my points across and demolished your your perspective but actually by kind of intellectually humiliating someone you're not necessarily going to have mm -hmm. encouraged them to to actually come over to your side or, or, or you know, and so to, to that extent, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about winning an argument. Um, I'm much more concerned about, OK, what what will this person think about Christianity? You know, if it's a non-Christian I'm talking to by the end of this conversation, will they be persuaded that if I become a Christian, I'll have the fruits of peace and gentleness and self-control? Or will they think I'll become this arrogant, you know, know it all? Um, and and that's the important thing. I, ultimately, it's about much more than just arguments. So so the way we conduct ourselves, the, genuinely loving the person who's in front of you, and and not just treating them as a as a project and assignment, uh, yeah. I think that that goes a heck of a long way. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. We we have run out. I'd I'd love to just ask you, you know, if anybody wanted to follow up on some of the things that we've been talking about um how can they find you how can they find unbelievable is there anything else happening this this year 2023 that you'd love us to be aware yeah of? yeah well we, we're excited that we've got another season of our big conversation coming up um uh, it'll be running sort of from april through to the autumn and it's a special series of shows in partnership with john templeton foundation where we mm -hmm. get some of the biggest thinkers on some of the biggest questions so last year we had people like richard dawkins opposite francis collins um, the head of the human genome project um, talking about science and faith it's those those kinds of conversations we love bringing them and we've got some fabulous ones lined up so people want to look at that um, ahead of time or, or once those start going out, the big conversation dot show is the place to go, but you can find all of our resources from unbelievable along with our other websites and um, our articles, podcast videos at premierunbelievable.com. That's our new website for all of our stuff. If you want more about me and some of the stuff I do as well, I've got a website to justinbriley.com. So, so those are the places to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your wisdom. I think the, you know, the kind of headings that we've touched on uh, are really helpful for us. I think for most of us who live Monday through Saturday in workplaces, surrounded by people that don't know Jesus, mm. and we just want to love them and we want to speak yeah. Jesus into their lives and discuss things really well. Uh, you've given us some really good tips. So thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Brilliant. Grace and peace. You too.